a lot of what I do in here is like culture collection and breeding of mushrooms. But I've really been excited about the molecular biology work that I've been doing. Um, I started off doing molecular identification of mushrooms. The main thing that I do in my lab is bring in wild cultures, mostly cordyceps militaris. I'll bring in a specimen of cordyceps, I'll clone it, I'll grow out the clone, or I'll take spores from the wild specimen or I'll take spores from the clone. Once I have spores, collect them and then I grow single spores. Um, from these single spores, we have to figure out what their mating type is. Basically, are, is it a boy or a girl uh, for, for layman's terms. Then once I know if it's a boy or a girl, I can mate the boy to the girl and produce offspring. Um, and when you breed them by single spores, um, you have more control over the outcome of uh, the morphologies. You can start to say like, oh, this one is producing mushrooms that have long stroma or um, this one is producing higher cordycepin. I'm gonna keep breeding it with the other one that's producing long stroma and high cordycepin. We're delving more into the molecular uh, side of thing, maybe figure out why is this mushroom producing these compounds? Why does this mushroom fruit the way that it does? Um, you can figure out a lot of these things through the DNA. For the most part, a lot of us are capable of uh, macroscopically identifying mushrooms. So we look at it, we see the morphological features and we're like, okay, this is XYZ mushroom. But sometimes you'll find a mushroom and you're just like, what is this? I don't know what it is. You look at it under a microscope and you still can't tell what it is. Um, then the last thing that you will do is molecular identification, where you'll take a mushroom, you'll extract the DNA from it, um, you'll amplify the DNA, send it off to be sequenced. Um, but there are new next generation sequencing uh, tools that I've been learning about. Um, I, I went to a class in New York on nanopore sequencing, where you can get whole genomes and you can also do meta metagenomics, where you take like a soil sample and you can get the DNA of all of the different uh, organisms that's in the soil. Uh, so that's really cool because this DNA sequencer is like the size, it's smaller than this tube rack. It's like a size of a stapler. Soon we can have like DNA sequencers on our phone. Um, they're even going to release a product soon, uh, Oxford Nanopore, that you can just attach to your iPhone and do DNA sequencing off of your phone. These are all single spore uh, cultures that I still need to check their mating type, which I'll usually do through molecular identification. Um, and then I work a lot with like liquid cultures. It's just like a sterile, simple, simple sugar uh, with a fungal culture in it that I can stick syringes in and out of to either sell them or uh, use them to introduce it into a, a jar of grains, which I can then expand into like a bag of sawdust. So the lab I use for clean work, it's not really a flow hood. I, I would just consider this a HEPA filter. It has a fan in the back, it blows clean air towards me, which allows me to do clean work in front of it. I keep my table nice and clean. And then the lab has a positive pressure in it. Um, so there's uh, always air being blown into the lab, which pushes air out of any place that air might potentially want to come in from, which keeps it clean on another level. So yeah, what I've been focused on mostly is just doing this molecular ID for mating types so I can do breeding. Um, so I can give you guys like a little rundown of what um, molecular ID looks like for mushrooms. So we have some cordyceps here, I have some lion's mane, I have some reishi, and uh, we're going to go ahead and test these samples. I'll usually label all of my tubes here, I have these centrifuge tubes. Um, typically I'll have my flow hood on just to make sure that it's extra clean um, because on us we have DNA or RNA like enzymes that are capable of breaking down uh, DNA so you want to just be careful. The centrifuge tubes typically come clean and free of DNA, uh, DNA and RNA. I'll typically start taking pictures of everything. So this is my number one. I took a picture of that and make sure that's number one and then number two, number three. So I remember what's in all the tubes. Uh, people might do it differently. Maybe use a notebook or something like that, but that's what works for me. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and spray this down with some isopropyl alcohol just to make sure the outside's clean. There we go. Um, I'll have a scalpel and I'll sterilize it in the back disintegrator, um, which also has a high enough heat that it can break down the DNA that's on there. Open that guy up. And then this comes out really, really hot. Um, so I always have like a little clean dish of water agar that I can cool down my scalpels in. So I'll go in here and I'll just find a little bit of mushroom. Like I really, you, you don't need that much. Um, there's a lot of DNA in a little, in a little bit of, uh, of a mushroom. So I'll take that and I'll just stick it right in there. 
sterilize that again. Move on to my next sample. For the most part, I already know what these are gonna come back as. It's gonna be Cordyceps militaris because I know and molecular, I know macroscopically that it's Cordyceps militaris. I grew out the cultures, I grew it myself, I know it's Cordyceps militaris. But one thing I can do is utilize the information I get from this DNA sequence to build a phylogenetic tree um, so I can know how closely related my Cordyceps specimens are. But it becomes interesting to know whenever you're breeding how closely related the parent cultures are and things like that so you can uh, breed genetics that aren't related. So I'm going to take another little sample. Stick that in there. Sterilize that again. I'm going to go for a sample of this lion's mane here. That's probably a little too much. Set that down there. Cut it in half. Stick that guy in there. Sterilize that again. Ganoderma multipileum. So go ahead and get a little piece of tissue off of this. There you go. You don't really need that much. This, not, this might not be like the regular procedure, but I still get good results. So that's what really matters at the end of the day. Um, so these pipette tips, I'm going to go ahead and put one of these tips on my pipette and set this to 100 microliters. Um, I have some extraction solution here that I made at home and this is something that people buy from uh, different companies but you can go a DIY route and make it at home a little bit cheaper. I'm going to add this extraction solution to each of these and this will help get the DNA out of the tissue. So I have some of these uh, pestles that I had in a uh, bleach solution. Uh, but what the pestle does is uh, helps you to grind your material. Um, so for the sake of the experiment, I'm just gonna go ahead, grind this material up. You can see with some mushrooms in the extraction solution, the pigments come out. It's like really, really orange in there. Yeah, because I don't have a heat block, um, I typically just put my my tubes in a glass jar and put it on a bo in a boiling water a pot of boiling water upstairs um, and that works out really well um, so i'm going to add an equal amount of dilution solution so again another 100 microliters and because i'm not like sticking the pipette tip into the tubes um, i can use the same pipette tip over and over again if i was to stick this in the sample 
it would get contaminated with the DNA of whatever sample and I'd be just contaminating and potentially messing up my results. I try and do whatever I can to make this work a little bit better. Yeah, so typically I'll put this on a heat block and it like brings it almost to like boiling temperature, which doesn't really harm the DNA at all. I have a big centrifuge underneath my table that I use um, whenever I'm doing eight at a time. And I'll typically run this for about four minutes. Uh, centrifuge spins it, so right now I have like solid materials in a solution. And the centrifuge brings the solid materials to the bottom so I can separate it from the liquid material. So now that everything's centrifuged, the, all of the solid materials at the bottom. I like the orange color that comes with the cordyceps. Gotta move a little bit faster because once I mix primers and the master mix together, the master mix basically has DNTPs or single nucleotide. So the uh, like A, C, T, G, um, all of the different nucleotides that uh, bases for the DNA, they have free nucleotides floating in the solution. Um, then I put a primer in that uh, has the beginning and the end of the gene that I want. So for fungal identification, we use the ITS gene. Um, so I have primers as the beginning and the end. Whenever I put it, run it in the PCR, it'll say, start here, stop here. Um, and then it'll, the PCR basically pulls apart the DNA by heating and cooling it down. When it heats up, it pulls the DNA apart. The free nucleotides will, will connect with the opposing uh, nucleotides that are on that uh, DNA that's broken in half. And then whenever it cools down, it'll uh, anneal, it'll come back together. And on the first run, you have one copy of the DNA, it pulls it apart, puts the free ones on it, and it makes a copy. Um, so by the end of the time that the PCR is running, there's over a billion copies of the DNA, which makes it a little bit easier um, to see in the gel electrophoresis, and it makes it easier for whoever's gonna be sequencing it because you have a lot more DNA to work with. So in a separate tube, I have my math all here on my piece of paper that I did, so I'm going to do, well, doing a four, rea a four sample reaction so I can cut this in half. So, let's see, 76 uh, microliters of water, I'm not the best at math, so I usually use my calculator. 76 divided by 2, 38, I'm going to do 38 microliters of water here. And I have really clean water right here. And I'm gonna do 50 microliters of master mix. So all this stuff usually stays pretty cold. Um, it'd be great if I had like a little bowl of ice or something right now. microliters of forward and reverse primers. I always start with my forward primer. Just make sure that's all mixed up. 
All right, so basically, since I put those all together, the reaction has started. So you kind of want to just do this next part a little bit faster. You don't want to lollygag or anything like that. Um, so what I'll do next, so I'll get my little PCR here. Because I'm only doing four reactions, I only need four tubes. put my solution into the PCR tubes. Just gonna make sure, I'm just gonna flick this real quick. Some of the things I need um, will be really helpful for my work is a heat block and a vortexer. Um, um, so like you'll see sometimes I'm like flicking things or shaking things that I can have, if I had a vortexer, I can mix it up for me. But when you're doing it from your own funds in your own home, you don't have grants and things like that, it's a little hard to get everything you need all the time. And then I'm gonna add one microliter of my solution into this. So it's like a tenth of a drop. It's really all you need to get it started, which is really crazy how small of a scale uh, molecular biology you're working on. That little drop right there is all the DNA I need. That will eventually expand into some billion copies. So I put my reaction, uh, my PCR tubes in there with all of my um, DNA that I extracted. And this is the part where it's amplified. Um, so now it's in the PCR, I just take it over here. That's doing denature, uh, the denaturation. And you'll see after a while, it's just gonna like go up and down and up and down and up and down. And eventually we'll have like a bunch of DNA copies. So at this point, I mean, you can save this. Um, if, so, if you know that you messed up somewhere along the line, you might want to reuse these. Um, but if you think you messed up with these, then you can just throw them away. Or if you get success uh, with your, with your uh, amplification, then you really don't need these anymore. So right now we have four copies of DNA and eventually that four will be eight and then that eight will be 16 and so on and so on. I just want to teach more people how to um, do science, you know, how to take control of, of, of their lives and their, and their work and um, learn how to utilize these scientific methods to, to make life better for themselves and for the people around them. So I'm just scratching the surface, you know. Um, I think by posting these things online all the time, posting these on social media and even doing videos like this, it helps to inspire more people to figure out even more cool things that we can be doing. Cause like, I'm so focused on cordyceps that the mating type thing is what I figured out, but like maybe somebody's focused on some plant or maybe somebody's focused on some other mushroom or some insect and they find out all sorts of other cool stuff. 